tell me, have you ever gone on vacation and left your child home? No. No. But I did leave one at a funeral parlor once. Yeah, I was, uh, it was terrible, too. You know, I was all distraught and everything, you know, the wife and I. We left the, the little tyke there in the funeral parlor all day. All day. You know, we, we went back at night when, you know, when we came to our senses. And there he was. Apparently, he was there alone all day with a corpse. <sighs> now, he was okay, you know, after six, seven weeks. And I came around, started talking again. Uh, but he's okay. You know, they get over it. Kids are resilient like that. Maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Well, you brought it up. I was just, I know. you know, trying well, to cheer I'm you up. I'm sorry I did. Hello and welcome to episode 57 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark, and things are going to be a bit different on today's episode. I'm going to be joined by a close friend called Tracy Morgan. Now Tracy has just released a brand new book called Searching for Candy, which celebrates the life and times of John Candy. And as you're listening to this podcast right now, it's been 25 years since his passing. So I thought it'd be a great idea to get Tracy on the show, discuss the book, discuss the life and times of John and just celebrate what a great actor and what a great human being he was and how much it sucks that he's now no longer with us. So I'm absolutely thrilled that Tracy's going to be joining me on today's episode. Now let's just touch base on the last episode. I was joined by Billy Mitchell. Yes, the King of Kong. Well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But this was a guest I've been trying for for 18 months and an interview I didn't think that would happen. It took more work, more determination, more emails and eventually it happened and the response was worth every moment it took for me to make this happen. It was insane. I've had more tweets, more Facebook comments, more emails, more messages from my close friends and fans and it's been huge. By far one of the biggest interviews I've done and as we're sitting here right now it's my second most downloaded episode that I've released which is huge. So a big thanks to everyone that tuned in and like I said the response was phenomenal. I think it changed a lot of the people's opinions of him. I think he was always painted as the, the villain and the, the, the bad guy and people kind of saw that there was a different side to him and I think the interview that I did really did break that down and give people a real insight to what really is Billy Mitchell so again a a huge accomplishment for this podcast and I'm so glad it's out there now for you all to enjoy as I said at the start of today's episode I'm joined by my good friend Tracy I'm so proud of her it's such a hard task to release a book it's so hard to finish a book so to know that she's done this and she's done it in style I couldn't be more proud of my friend and that's why I've got her here today on Mark and Me So without further ado, here is me and my friend Tracy Morgan talking all things John Candy. Well, Tracy, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. So the listeners out there won't know me and you that well, but obviously we've grown up together. Yeah. I've known you and it's scary. I think we sat and worked out the other day. It's about about 20 years that we've known each other, which is mad. It is, yeah, it is. Although I haven't seen you for a long time, but we've got... A lot of pictures, a lot of evidence and a lot of memories, I think. And some of those pictures and evidence we don't really want people to see. No. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question for you today is, what was your first ever experience of a John Candy movie? As far back as I can remember, um, my eldest brother David, who's sort of only about 18 months, two years older than me, used to watch films and like get absolutely obsessed and watch them constantly. And I remember, I can't remember if it was Splash or Brewster's Millions that came first, but if I wanted to hang out with my cooler older brother, I kind of had to, like, be quiet and watch the films he was watching. And um, certainly Brewster's, I remember he watched, like, religiously um, any any moment that he had for sort of a period of time. Um, and I just fell in love with John Candy. I mean, obviously I love Richard Pryor, but John Candy um, in Splash and Brewster's Millions, uh, he just sort of spoke to me on the screen, really, and I just 
you know, there's just a, a sort of warmth about him that I just really loved. Um, so I guess it was my, my eldest brother, really, that introduced me to him. So obviously they're some really good classics to get you to have that kind of love for John, but yeah. it obviously grew at quite a fast rate. What were the sort of... Can you remember then kind of trying to go out there and find those films that, you know, starred that guy that you fell in love with in these early films? Or was it just a case of, oh, Home Alone's on and I recognise that same guy and, oh, Uncle Buck's the same guy from Home Alone? Or was it a case of, I want to now kind of find every film that this guy's in? At that age, I think it was just, oh my goodness, that, that lovely man's on telly. Yeah. Let's go and watch him. Um, or I recognise him, let's go and watch him. And I loved every role that he did. Later on, um, I'd say about eight years ago, the real obsession kicked in. And at that stage, I kind of just wanted to watch everything from movies to SCTV that he did um, when he sort of first broke out. They were doing like sketch shows to any sort of YouTube clips, interviews. At that stage, I just wanted to hoover everything up and just watch everything. So I think as a kid, it was probably a nice infatuation. And now as an adult, it's become more of an obsession, really. <laughs> so can you remember what it was that actually, I know obviously the early films you said that you watched with your brother triggered that love, but what was it as an adult? What Can you remember that point where it was like, this is something now that I want to invest this much time, travel, money of my life on because I've done it with Kevin Smith, you know, I've been obsessed with his yeah. films and I've gone and interviewed all the stars in his films, I've been lucky enough to meet him but I can't remember the day that I thought actually I'm going to become quite a fan and do everything I can but can you remember what it was that triggered it for you? It was depression that, that sort of triggered it all off really yeah. and I was kind of in a really bad place in my life and um, I needed to find some light really and I think that's when I went back to my childhood and uh, things that I loved in my childhood and I started watching John Candy movies, Uncle Buck, um, you know, the Blues Brothers, Planes, Trains and all of a sudden uh, there's this man that often plays the underdog on the screen and makes it okay to be so. You can be a loser and it's okay as long as your heart's in the right place and I just thought, my God, you know, I just think this is like one of the most wonderful man that I'd ever seen and I, I'd also saw something in him with he wasn't just a comedic actor he was a brilliant dramatic actor and at that stage I thought I want to know more and I read a book there's one book out there about him called Laughing on the Outside by Martin Neilman and nothing against Martin Neilman but I didn't I really quite hated the book <laughs> if yeah. I'm being honest um, it wasn't what I wanted I didn't feel like he covered the basis that I wanted as a fan Probably not his fault. He wrote it a couple of years after John had passed. So I think it was all still very raw back then for people to talk about John. So he wouldn't have necessarily got to talk to the right people. Um, but I just thought, Do you know what? I have no idea what I'm doing. Maybe this is it. I started researching and I thought maybe I've never, never thought I was going to be an author or anything <coughs> like that. But it was all of a sudden it was something that gave my life a bit of meaning. And... Um, and the more I researched into him, the more I fell in love with him. And he turned out to be everything I wanted him to be and more. So it's been like a real joy, but it's been a real labour of love. <laughs> and quite hard at times. I obviously don't want to focus too much on the depression, because obviously you're out of that state of mind now and that condition. Um, but was, yeah. it the, was it the life of John and obviously this character that you could relate to that gave you that focus to not focus on the bad and negative and being in that state? Was it, the, was it the love of John and, you know, reading more about him that helped you improve and, you know, get better? I think it was a bit of both. I think just watching those characters on the screen that, you know, either had a tough time or hadn't really found themselves and then sort of, you know, found, found a way around that and everyone loved them anyway. Um, and I think just researching into John's life, I found some similarities. I'm a big comfort eater. I lost my dad when I was quite young, not as young as John was when he lost his dad. Um, but it was kind of like, you know, life doesn't stop here. You can make a success of yourself. And I think that kind of intrigued me a little bit. And I just I just felt bad for John because I thought, my God, this, you know, he was a bona fide movie star. He was loved by millions of people. There's one book out there, and okay, it's, you know, it's not my cup of tea, but some, a lot of people love it. Um, but there really needs to be more. Why isn't there more? Um, and I thought, well, maybe maybe this is it. Maybe this is what I'm going to do. And it, it did. 
Um, every time I kind of learned a new story about John, you know, it kind of made me feel better about myself because I was going to put that back out into the world. So, yeah, it, it really did help me heal, I think. So at that point you just touched on, you were saying that, um, and I, I say this with full respect, you had no idea what you were doing. You hadn't wrote a book before. Um, you'd yeah. read this book about John Candy, which you respected, but you didn't love it. And obviously you kind of wanted to paint a, a different light to his life and take it into your own hands. And that's a big, you know, there's one thing having a bit of a, a thought process of, do you know what, I fancy writing a book, but then to actually put it into reality and then invest so much time and start the you know the ball rolling it's a huge huge decision to make was it something that you kind of found yourself not even realizing you were doing it because it was just you know like the snowball effect you were finding out more stories you were reading more and before you knew it you had so much information you just kind of went with it yeah I think so and I think I'm not sure had I not told people I was doing it whether I would have actually eventually got it done yeah. Um, I'm never going to give myself a deadline for a book ever again. <laughs> no. Um, because life just gets in the way a lot of the time. And it's kind of taken probably about four long, yeah, about four years longer than what I anticipated it would um, for various different reasons. And some of them for the better. So I never really, I kind of fell into it going, right, I'm going to write a book. And I don't think people took me very seriously. But when I put mine to something, if I'm nothing else, if I'm not talented or anything else, I can be tenacious. And that's yeah. the one thing I've got on my side. Um, then when you tell people you're doing it, especially if they laugh at you, you think, okay, right, I'm going to show you. And it may have taken me longer than people thought it would, took me longer than I thought it was going to. I had to learn, not how to write, because you know I knew how to write, but how to write uh, well enough to write a book. Um, that took some time as well. But with that came benefits, really. People who said no to an interview when I was in year number two of doing the book said yes to an interview in year number five. So uh, it all kind of worked out eventually, even if it was frustrating to some people because I thought I was going to get it done in two years or so. So, you know, it kind of had a life of its own at that stage. So when you started to actually put it into terms of reality and think, you know what, I'm going to do this book, I'm going to put it out there... You did say, obviously, it was delayed longer than you wanted, but that also had some advantages because then it meant you got those interviews that at the start you were refused. So it's a, it's a, yeah. it's it's all meant to be, in my opinion. I always think that you know these things yeah. happen for a reason. But to set out the kind of starting point for the book, what was your thought process? Was it that you wanted to cover his whole life? Was it that you wanted to get stories out there that people didn't know? Were you trying to change people's perception because? I've never met anyone in the whole world that doesn't like John Candy or says, no. oh, his films are shit. He's, yeah. He always feels like a father figure or someone in your family that you just trust and love from the first moment you see him on screen. Yeah, he's like, he is everybody's Uncle Buck. Everybody wants an Uncle Buck. Yeah, and especially those pancakes. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be amazed, honestly. I'd be so happy if people could make pancakes that size. That would, would be, be amazing. I think initially it was going to cover his whole life because I thought maybe if I don't get interviews at the very least I can research and the world's a small place these days you can get on an ancestry.com you can find that history that way um so even if I didn't get some interviews I could do something even if it's not a very long book about John I can put something else out there and I knew that because there was YouTube videos and interviews I could look at that and I could actually use a lot of his own words as well because he's not here to talk for himself so I could sort of study those interviews and go through those. And then as I went on, it kind of evolved. And I started getting these stories that other people hadn't heard. Just stories of absolute joy and kindness of, of things that John would do. Like, for example, he was working on a set and one of the security guards were having a really hard time. They were due to get evicted from their house with their whole family. And on the last day of filming, although John hadn't got to know him that well, he got to hear about his story, and he went up to him and gave him a hug and said, you know, everything's going to be all right. Later on that day, that security guard <coughs> found $10,000 in his pocket. Bloody hell. And, you, and, and that, that's not unusual. That's like one of a myriad of stories that I have heard and have been told, and I'm sure there's a million more that I'm still yet to discover. And that was John Candy. He was like like the nicest person you would ever want to meet, and then some. And he would treat every single person the same. You know, the janitor as the director. 
I interviewed Tim Kazowinski from Police Academy. Yeah. Everyone knows him as Sweet Chuck. And he worked with Don on Big City Comedy and became friends with him. And he was telling me a story where he, he didn't tell me the film because that would have revealed which director it was. But one of the one of the guys working on the film was really stripped down in front of everybody. I mean, this director tore him a new asshole in front of everybody. And once he'd finished, he just said, I, I just watched John. And John just walked up to the director and just had a very quiet word and said, um, you talk to him the same way you speak to me, with respect. And if you don't do that, I'm off. And I think... For someone like John, who was so desperate to work all the time and always looking for the next thing, he wasn't afraid of standing up for the underdog, basically, which yeah. is what he portrayed. He, he ne- was never scared of that. He was never scared of losing a job because he would stand up for somebody. And he would never lose his temper, you know, with himself, you know, in terms of, like, if he did something to John, he'd try and understand. And if he did something against somebody else, so he thought that was really unfair you would be told <laughs> and I love that about him too I love that he didn't just play the underdog he stuck up for the underdog as well you know in real life and obviously when you had this list of names you just mentioned one there from Police Academy did you have a certain you know wish list of people that you wanted to speak to when you are doing research some of them were you know were going to be dreams and some of them were reality obviously there's, there's the sort of obvious choices like Mel Brooks um, who worked with him on Spaceballs who I got which was fantastic, um, and Mel Brooks was just as nice as you'd imagine to be, and was probably more interested in me uh, than he was doing the interview. You know, he like really wanted to chat. Do you know what I mean? And get to know you. That's brilliant. Um, and then there was people like Carl Reiner, who I got to interview as well. Dave Thomas, Mariel Hemingway, Tim Kazaninski, and then there was like people that I knew of that I thought, oh, I don't know if they'll speak to me or not. They're not necessarily world famous but they were a big part of John's life like Joel Hellmeyer who used to be the wardrobe wizard on SCTV uh, and then he ended up being John's dresser on Cool Runnings and was just friends with John for years and, and loved him so much and then there was people that I really wanted like Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray um, and I just couldn't get them. <laughs> if you would got Bill Murray that would have been the complete game. I don't think he's even got a telephone has he people say. Oh I'm <clears> going <throat> to find him don't you worry I'm going out looking for him. He's, he's not going to know what's hitting. I will have to get a plane over there and go searching, but I will find Bill Murray. <laughs> You've heard it here. And obviously all the stories that came from these people, obviously your book's only a certain size, there's only a certain amount that will make the book. Yeah. Was it kind of really hard to edit those down and pick the, the strongest parts? Because I'm sure if it was an audio podcast, you could release 50 hours worth of material. If it was a documentary, you could watch 10 hours, but... In a book, obviously, you have to pick the best parts that make that final cut, and that must have been really torturous to leave some of those stories out. It can be really hard, but I figure I've got my blog, so what I might do is some of the stories that I couldn't put in this time round, I might put them up on my blog, or I might do a, an extended version, uh, a director's cut as such, and, um, and do a second edition at some stage. But certainly those stories aren't going to be lost. I'll find a way to get them out whether it's that or a podcast or, you know, some some way, shape or form that I can get those stories out. They, they need to be told to the world because there's some lovely stories in there. And what were the, some of the stories? Obviously, I, I'm not going to um, put people off buying your book. I want them to go out there and <laughs> discover them. But what were some of the most fascinating stories that blew your mind? I think just some of the kindness stories, really, because I just don't think there's enough out there about just how lovely he was. And because he never, ever sort of told anybody or got in the press about it, he didn't do things that way. Um, I just know that he's helped an awful lot of people that are still walking around today. Um, and he's so so magical, really, in that sense. Um, on Only the Lonely, which was a film in 1991 that he did with Chris Columbus, Chris Columbus had written the script and was directing, and he had written the part of John's mother, especially for Maureen O'Hara. Um, Maureen O'Hara had been retired from acting for 20 years and had absolutely no interest in going back. Eventually, she read the script, and she said, if I like John and I like Chris, then I'll do it. And it took about two minutes um, for her to meet John and go, all right, I'll be your mother, you know, because who wouldn't want to be? <laughs> when they first started on set, 
because um, obviously at that stage Maureen had been out of the scene for a while and John um, was, a, was a, 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 an A-lister at that stage um, they had these um, trailers on set and Maureen O'Hara was given a honey wagon um, which is basically like a tiny little box trailer it has a, a tiny bed it's, it's like, a, like a tiny dressing room basically and um, John had been given a massive trailer that you know a whole family could live in he kind of went, you know, this is Maureen O'Hara from The Quiet Man, you know. Yeah. She can't be in the honey wagon. Um, and obviously John was a big guy, and the honey wagon, so it's small anyway, but for John to go in one is, is quite a big deal. Um, and he said, no, there's no chance Maureen's having the honey wagon, you know, we're swapping over, and I'm having the honey wagon. And he, he did that for about two days until the, the production team gave in and gave them both a big trailer. But I just, I just kind of like love that kindness to him. I think one of the things that I kind of I also related to with John was I didn't realise, and I don't think anyone does realise if you're just a normal John Candy fan watching the films, is that he always thought he was going to die young, always. He was kind of apologetic for the way he lived in some ways for people that worked with him. I remember Kevin Pollock saying to me, he almost felt like he had to explain. Because in his career, which wasn't actually that long, he did like 42 films, which is amazing. Yeah. And it was all to bank roll money for his family. Because he was in some doozies, don't get me wrong, you know. Um, there are some bad films out there that John Candy took part in. But I think with John, when you watch them, you always go, well, actually, John made it better. It might have been a bad film, but John made it better, and his part was great. Yeah. And I think as an actor, that's all any actor can do. But yeah, I think that was one of the things that kind of shocked me, is just how much he, he actually thought he wasn't going to be around very long and so he lived his life to the full he drank he went out he slept not very much actually he stayed up late a lot um and he kind of just absorbed life as much as he could do you think genuinely obviously we can never ask him but do you think he was happy because he's always a larger than life character he's always smiling we never see a depressed character that he plays but obviously the people around him what they remember do you think he was wearing a mask and inside he was a sad person and down or do you think he was a very the guy that we wanted him to be i think he was the guy that wanted you wanted him to be um i think there's an element of like none of us are happy 100 percent of the time that's just not not human nature and i don't think i would create any news headlines by saying you know comedians have a dark side because generally they've been through some real shit and it's yeah. comedy that actually helps them deal with what they've been through and I think there was parts of John that was that was kind of sad. I think he was sad. He lost his dad when he was five years old, and I think he was sad he never had that father figure. And I think he felt that a lot as he was growing up, and then when he had his own kids, I think he realised just how much he missed out on there. But I think, you know, in general, I think he loved life. I mean, he loved his family. I mean, it, it, for him, having that family, having Rose's wife and Jen and Chris's kids, he was living the dream. And he would often say, you know, like, I get I get to go to work and play around and, and they pay me for it. I think later on he became disillusioned with the business side of things because everybody wants to be your best friend or your new best friend and everyone wants a piece of you. And I think that was very hard for him. But I think he naturally gravitated towards people that got him, like John Hughes, for example. They were huge friends. And in my opinion, and this is only my opinion, obviously John Hughes isn't here to say either, but I actually think that when John Candy passed away, that's that's one of the reasons why John Hughes left Hollywood. Yeah. Um, I think he blamed Hollywood, in a way, because I think everyone wanted so much from John Candy, and, you know, he would never say no. I think that was his problem, is that he wanted to say yes and please everybody, and you can't do that, you exhaust yourself. And people take advantage of that when you're a yes person as well. From that point of view, I, I would say he's happy generally. Um, but of course, none of us are happy 100% of the time. But John was 99% light. He just didn't want to let people down. And I think that was his downfall. This is going to be a tough question. I don't think you may have been asked this. But if John okay. Candy was still with us now, yeah. do you believe like Dan Aykroyd he'd still be making films? Or do you think he would have invested his time spent with his family and retired quite early to enjoy those precious moments with his wife and kids. I think he'd still be working. 
I think maybe not as, as ferociously as he was, but I think he'd still be working. And I think he would have gone into directing yeah. because he started towards the end of his, his career to direct. And he, he did um, a TV movie called Hostage for a Day. And he kind of loved that creative control that it gave him. And I think he would have been doing more dramatic roles. I think he would have got pickier because I think he said yes to some things he didn't want to do because he was scared that the next job wouldn't come or that he was going to have to bank roll money for his family if he wasn't going to be around. So I think had he still been around, he would have been pickier. But I think we, he had so much more to... He gave so much, but he had so much more to give as well. And I think we would have seen a real different side to him, to be honest. And obviously we talked about the start of this book being set out and the you know, the two years turn into five years. But the good news yeah. is, and you know, we end on a positive, that the book is now finished. Yes. What was it and how did you know it was the moment to put the pen down and say this is it? Because, like you said, there's stuff that didn't make the final cut. There's stuff that you want to do on a blog or a podcast. But yeah. what was the what was the moment when you thought, that's now time to call it a day and this book is now finished? Do you know what? Without my editor, Joe Schumann, I'm not sure I would have. And it was a case of, like, I do need to. I need to get this out there. And then, you know, it's, a book is a living object, really. It can change all the time, so you can do a second edition. And he kind of really had to give me a pep talk. As you know, come on, you've done all this work. People deserve to see it. And I'm absolutely terrified, if I'm honest. I'm terrified that people are going to hate the book. I'm terrified that, you know, people are going to go, all these years and she's produced this. <laughs> But I think I'm happy with it, as it is at the moment. I think I will do a second edition at some stage, but right now I think I'm happy with it. And I hope, hope, hope that John would be. Um, obviously, there's things now it's gone to print, and I'm like, oh, I wish I put this in, or I wish I put that in. I just have to save it for another time, I guess. But it needed to, it needed to finish. And I had, I had a bit of a scare um, in 2017, and an awful lot happened, and I lost a dear friend, and it broke my heart. And he was my age. And I thought, my God, you know, what happens if I don't get this out, you know, and something happens to me? I need, I need to at least get one version out there. So I kind of think just the way life was going, I just needed to finish. But that's a good <laughs> whatever, thing. You know, whatever people think of it, it's out there. And I'm sure it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I believe in you. I've always believed in you ever since you started oh. and told me about this. But the thing is, you did it for John and you did it for yourself. And... Yeah. You know, anyone else that then buys it and loves it is a bonus. But you, and I know you, your heart is John and you did this in memory of him and as a, yeah. a tribute. So isn't that all that matters? Yes, I, I think you're right. Yes, when you put it like that, thank you as well, by the way. That's really kind of you. Um, yes, that's what matters. At the end of it is, is that it's a book about John and I've done it for him. And it's been done with love. If people don't like it, I think that at least they will say... It was done with love, we can tell that. But at the same time, there's just that part of you that wants people to love it. <laughs> you want people to go, she did a good job. So who knows? I guess that's, that's yet, to, we'll, we'll see, won't we, at some stage, but you know. And then obviously the interesting fact about this is that you're taking it on yourself, you're publishing it yourself. Um, yeah. This is a big decision, you know, that it, to, to get a big publisher behind it is the dream, but I also quite like the fact, like the podcast, like a lot of the projects I do, it's all my own, you know, you haven't got someone coming in and taking over the creative control and, you know, taking this bit out and, oh, let's, let's, let's lie and add this bit in to try and sell more copies. Isn't it quite nice that it's, it's yours and you own it and there's, you know, it's, it's, it's from the heart and, you know, it, it's everything that you wanted it to be? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a pride that comes with that just for the fact, you know, you have done it yourself. And I think, like you were saying with the podcast, I think you should be so proud of the podcast. Like, what you have achieved is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And what you're achieving and what you're going to achieve is awesome. And I think you should be mega proud of that. And I guess, yeah, at the end of the day, I've done it. You know, we've done it ourselves. So no one can take that away from us. And when you put anything out on the internet, whether it's art or a podcast or, or writing, that exists. You know, it's kind of a, a legacy we're leaving behind us, really, as well. Um, so I guess from that point of view, yes. And I think, I mean, early on, I, I talked to publishers and they were like, if you can find scandal, then we'll take it. And I'm like, I'm not looking for scandal. I'm not digging for dirt. No. You could make a molehill into a mountain. What's the point in that? That doesn't, we all have molehills in our lives. They don't make a whole life, do they? No. Um, 
And I think that's a great thing that, you know, people doing stuff independently, like you, like me, and so many others that are doing it out there, um, it, you know, you can keep your integrity, and it's honest. Yeah. You know? And I like the word legacy because I know that if I have kids or when I pass, I've got this and they're done and someone else can enjoy it and take stuff from it and it's there forever. You know, if if someone yeah, likes Anthony forever. Hopkins and they can listen to the interview, that's never going to be taken away. It's always going to be available for people and Jeff Buckley's manager and Kevin Smith and all these people because they meant a lot to me and, you know, that's something that I yeah. can give back to people and, you know, it doesn't cost anything and it's there forever. And with this book... Someone will read it in twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years time, and that must be a quite nice feeling that there'll be stories, and there will be other people like you that fall in love with these films, want to know more, and you can give them that that they, you know, that you wanted, but you're now the giver. It's it's a weird like circle, but it's nice. It is a nice circle. Do you know we all live forever, really, in that sense. We never ever truly pass. I think there's well, there's a Terry Patrick quote that I have at the beginning of the book um, that's quite a famous quote. I'm going to read it out of the book, so I get it wrong if not. But you know, no one is actually dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away. And I think so if anybody listening now wants to do something, just put it out in the world. Do it because we're all like in this together, aren't we? Really, exactly. We're all cheering each other on. Nobody's in competition. We'll, we'll all help each other. And, uh, and none of us are getting out of here alive. <laughs> yeah. Let's face it. And it's not a race, um, you know, it's not a contest. It's it's everyone's helping everyone, and that's how it should be. And that's yeah. what I love about writers and directors and producers and podcasters and movie makers. Everyone has that creative love and respect for each other. It's magic, isn't it, really? It is. It is, and it's uh, it's something that I will never leave. I, I will never hang up the microphone and headphones, and I'm sure you'll never put the pen down because... It's it's what we do, it's what we're here to do, and I just want to keep on doing it forever. You're doing a fab job. You will be doing it forever. You do such a good job, seriously. And what we need to do now is, for all the listeners out there that are now juiced up and want to read this book, Searching for Candy, what is the way that they can go about? Because this is your moment, this is what I want people now oh. to go and do. <laughs> What's the best way for them to get their hands and read this book? The best way is to go on Amazon. Yeah. Um, if you can go on Amazon, it's released on the 5th of March. So John's passing, actually, uh, it was on the 4th of March, and that marked 25 years of his passing. Um, and out of respect to his family, I didn't want to do it on the actual day. So I'll do it the day after. Um, so it's 5th of March. You can go onto Amazon anywhere in the world. You can download it as an e-book or you can buy a paperback. And um, and if people would like to do that, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy it. And likewise, if they don't, thanks for listening anyway. <laughs> and what's the best way for them to reach out on Facebook? There's a page, isn't there, specifically for the book? That's right, yeah. Um, Facebook.com slash searching for candy. Brilliant. So if anyone wants to come and follow me on there, I'd love that, you know. I'm, like, I'm quite interactive on there, so if anybody wants to chat or anything, just send me a message. That sounds awesome. And I'm really hoping this book does well. I'm hoping it sells well loads. It's not all about the numbers. It's not about hitting silly, silly milestones. But I just want people to invest their time in this story because you've invested a lot of your life. And I think, you know, to give that back to people now, you know, invest their time and hopefully enjoy and see how much love's gone into it because i think that's the best word love has gone into this and you know like you said if someone doesn't like it they can at least respect that love's gone into it yeah thank you so much mark you're making me all emotional so there it is there's me and my good friend tracy and what a lovely girl she is i'm so proud to be able to call her my friend and i'm so proud that she's released this book I think it's really difficult nowadays to write a book and get it out there. And to know that she's doing this herself, I couldn't be more proud to say she's a close friend of mine. And I wish you all the luck in this release. As you've just listened and hopefully you've been juiced up now and you really want to read this book, I urge you to go on Amazon and order a copy. You can go on there and order a digital copy or you can get a paperback. But this will really help Tracy. And I can't reveal and I wouldn't do this right now, but I know she's got another book planned. And if you buy this book now, it will help fund that second release, which I think is crucial. And anyone out there right now trying to make a a name for themselves in any sort of form of media really does need all the support from the people out there. So please check it out. You can go on Facebook under Searching for Candy and leave comments. Tracy will reply. She reads all the comments like I do with Mark and me, and I know it will mean a world to her if you take the time to do that. Please, as always, keep supporting Mark and me. You can go on markandme.com, and on there there's links to my Twitter, 
my Facebook, my Instagram, but also my Patreon. And I do need more people to sign up because the hosting space for these episodes is getting quite pricey because more and more people are jumping on board. It's not a bad problem to have. It's quite good. It's nice to know people are listening. But the server space for all these episodes is getting big and getting quite pricey. And all the money that you guys help and donate through the Patreon goes straight back in. I don't pay myself. It just goes on traveling. It gets me to go out and do these interviews and keep the servers running so you can all listen to the podcast for free on Spotify and iTunes and Podomatic etc. You did hopefully see this week I've announced that the podcasts are going to be weekly now for the next few months. That's not forever, that's just because I've got a backlog I want to get through and there's some really good episodes out there and hey, why should I make you guys wait if they're sitting there ready to be listened to? Thanks again for listening. Please, please, I urge you all to go and check out this book, Searching for Candy. And please, as always, stay safe and I'll speak to you all again in a week's time.